Thank you. Council Member Garcia? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Damien? Here. And Mayor Estrada? Here. Thank you for that. Uh, at this moment, I will open up public communications. Chief Deputy City Clerk, is there anybody looking to speak? No, Mayor. Okay, and seeing that there is nobody looking to speak, uh, I will move to close public communications and move on to our study session, which is regarding Esperanza Villa Year 2 and the Garvey 2.0 Grant Funding Opportunities presentation with uh, Brielle from the Regional Housing Trust and Manuel Carrillo from our Department of Recs and Community Services. Got it. <laughs> All right, now that you can hear me, can we go on to the next slide, please? Great, so this is a photo of Esperanza Villa. We're very excited to be almost at the six month mark. We opened on November 22nd, so in just a couple days, we'll have um, been open and serving clients for six months. Next slide. Okay, so what have we accomplished in six months? I'm very excited that there is an update to this slide that you're looking at. As of today, the sixth person has been placed into permanent housing and Volunteers of America has really caught their stride. They're the service provider. So within the next 30 days, 12 more clients are going to be connected to permanent housing, bringing us to 18 out of the first 25 um, being permanently housed. Um, other milestones, Almost 6,000 meals served, um, 22 referrals to health services, nine employment referrals, uh, six benefit referrals, so DPSS services. Uh, there are 15 participants on the wait list for the site, so as soon as those 12 clients I mentioned earlier move out, those units will be filled and we can help additional unhoused neighbors get into permanent housing. And there's an Another partnership at the site, which is with Kaiser Permanente, so that grant helps to serve seniors. So eight residents have been assisted through the Kaiser grant with needs, um, including medical equipment and wheelchairs. If we could go to the next slide. It is so much more than just a connection to permanent housing. That is definitely the ultimate goal for each client. But while clients are at the site, they're also able to celebrate smaller milestones. So the photo you see to the right is a happy birthday banner. It was actually Joe's birthday who was interviewed by Spectrum News when he moved into the site. We've also been able to celebrate special occasions at the site, including Thanksgiving lunch when we opened, um, Christmas cards, Valentine's Day, an Easter egg hunt, and birthday celebrations. And just to really humanize what the experience is like, the first client connected to permanent housing was a 76-year-old woman who had been homeless for nearly a decade. And within three months of receiving case management and services at Esperanza Villa, she is no longer unhoused and has her own senior apartment. And the second resident housed was also a senior female. So I think it's really, really heartening to hear these stories and more than half of the residents at Esperanza Villa, or more, of half, more than half of the initial residents were seniors. We could go to the next slide. Okay, so I mentioned that connections to permanent housing are going faster now. Volunteers of America is doing a great job doing monthly collaboration meetings with other service providers. So meeting with Union Station and other housing partners to make sure that clients' needs are being met and helping address where there might be any delays, making sure that clients are connected to documentation services that they need to get their licenses or anything else that might be slowing them down. The Baldwin Park Housing Authority has also been a really great partner, in particular with the Emergency Housing Voucher Program to help streamline that process. Um, and we're excited to announce that the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments is launching its Workforce Development Program this summer, which will include employment opportunities and living wages uh, providing jobs through Pallet Shelter, who provided the tiny homes for the units, Habitat for Humanity, and Active SGV. Currently, Goodwill is also providing um, job services at the site right now on Mondays um, through Measure H. And the COG is also launching a feminine hygiene uh, drive through its Village 143 program, which will benefit the site. We could go to the next slide. Really thankful to the city of Baldwin Park for setting an example for its neighbors. So you see here some of the cities that have come and toured the site. Um, the city of Torrance is working on 
building its tiny home site. While it's not in our region, they still came and looked to us for an example, which is very exciting. And the city of Montebello has an asterisk by it. Some of, um, some of you in attendance here were at its grand opening this morning. So 30 more units of interim housing in the San Gabriel Valley opened this morning. Okay, we could go to the next slide. There is a funding opportunity in front of us. So cities and councils of governments interim housing services fund. So this grant provides $80 per bed per night. And if approved by city council, the um, SGV COG will submit a joint application with the city to apply for operational funding for the second year at Esperanza Villa. The grant would extend operations from November of 2022 to November of 2023. Um, you can see in this diagram here, the program is already meeting most of the requirements, which include security and case management, three meals per day and hygiene services on site. The only update to the program so that it would qualify for this funding is to become fully housing first compliant. So to access this funding, the referral process for Esperanza Villa will need to update to remove the background check requirement and align with county and state, statewide housing first models. And if we go on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about housing first. So the goal of Housing First is to provide housing to individuals and families as quickly and with as few obstacles as possible. So applicants aren't rejected up for things based like credit or their criminal history. And Housing First is considered a national evidence-based best practice, which means the research shows that this method works best. In 2016, California became a housing first state, and more recently, the county of Los Angeles became a housing first county. So that's why this funding, this county funding source is a housing first funding source. So service providers in Los Angeles County follow the housing first model, including our service lead for this area. And Esperanza Villa is actually an outlier at the moment as the only tiny home site that is currently performing background checks. So updating this policy would bring us in alignment with what other um, tiny home and other bridge housing sites are doing and allow us to access the funding opportunity that we just mentioned. We could go on to the next slide. Also wanted to introduce the Garvey family site. So the trust provided 1.25 million to develop up to 50 beds of homeless housing at this site. This will serve families experiencing homelessness in Baldwin Park, which is a really great expansion to the individual tiny home program. Site will similarly have on-site laundry, restrooms, and showers, including, um, and also have case management and services on site. The existing garage at the site will be converted into a study area, which is really exciting for the children that will get to live there. And the city is working with Boss Cubes to um, provide modular units. So these are bigger than the tiny homes at Esperanza Villa to accommodate families. And then there's also the capacity to connect two units to accommodate larger families. So the trust will assist in securing a service provider like we did at the Esperanza Villa site. And this service provider will provide all of the wraparound services on the site, including 24 seven staffing, meals, and case management for clients. And the site is anticipated to open in late September of this year, which is pretty soon. We can go on to the next slide. This is a draft layout of what the site would look like. So that red line that you see is Garvey Avenue. The blue path is how clients would enter the site. This would provide ADA access into the site. And then you can see in the right of your screen, there are 16 units that can accommodate the 50 beds mentioned. So there'll be bunk beds um, and full beds to accommodate families. The two yellow units you're looking at are recommended as the units that could um, have a pass through door to expand to accommodate larger families. And the next slide shows a really pretty rendering of what this site could look like. So to be a, a warm and inviting space for families to end their experience with homelessness. Okay, and if we go on to the next one, we have a funding opportunity here too, which is really great for operational funding. So this is through Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority or LASA. And this program provides $90 per unit per night for family interim housing. So this is $10 more than the other county program that we're recommending for Esperanza Villa. And this is a non-competitive allocation. So these funds would be awarded to this project if the city accepts them. Local preference is allowed here. 
There'll be 24 seven staffing, including security at the site. This is also a housing first model. So this means um, no criminal background checks would be allowed at this site. Also, an imp also important to note that because we'd be using loss of funding, the um, federal or HUD definition of homelessness applies here. So it's clients that are literally homeless versus uh, couch surfing, which is sometimes allowed by the school district through the McKinney-Vinto Act. Undocumented families are eligible for this funding source and um, trust and Baldwin Park staff met with the Family Solutions Center to discuss best practices specifically for families to make sure that this program is going to fit their specific needs. And on the right there, you see a sample of what a boss um, cubes looks like. So it's larger than the Esperanza Villa tiny homes. Um, I actually got to go tour the Boss Cubes factory with your public works director, and we are very excited about what that product looks like. Okay, if we go on to the next slide, I'm actually going to turn this over to Manny Creo. Thank you very much, Brielle. Uh, hello, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council members. Brielle, thank you for your thorough and insightful presentation of Esperanza Via update, and also congratulations on the opening of the 30 site today in the city of Montebello. I have a few comments before I conclude the pre before we conclude the presentation. Uh, tonight, as part of the regular city council meeting, you'll have an opportunity to vote on consent calendar item number 10 in order for us to um, uh, apply for the, for the funding for Esperanza Via. In addition, I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge some of our team members. We have Eureka Ruiz Esparza, Community Ser Services Supervisor in the audience. So we have Carol Avaro, Housing Manager, who's also been a integral part. And last but not least, we have Ron Garcia, Acting Community Development uh, Director, that uh, together we have been working tirelessly on locating funding opportunities and uh, funding is the key. The City of Allen Parks Homeless Task Force has been at the forefront of every administrative meeting, Board of Supervisors proposed motions and other, and motions after multiple multitude of letters of support, and we now have the first ever funding opportunity in the total of $10 million across the county to fund cities and councils of governments to support operations and and interim housing services sites in local communities that are not central to the city of Los Angeles or to huge continuums of care that leave little or no funds to, for jurisdictions like us. Without this pivotal funding support, cities would not continue to, would continue to struggle to close the gap of the much needed and deserved housing resources for every unhoused resident in the city despite of what led them to experience homelessness in our in in our streets so uh without going on too much longer w once again consent calendar number 10 we have uh the we have a staff report hopefully city council will uh approve to move forward with that staff report in addition uh at the time we did not have the uh enough information to prepare a staff report, so we will be proceeding uh, in asking for an allocation from LASHA to uh, provide funding for year one for the Garvey family site. And uh, we are here to answer any questions that the city council may have. We have explored all options, including home ARP funds, and the only funding available at this point would be number one, general fund, or number two, LASHA, the money that we are requesting. And this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Mayor. Yes, Council Member Garcia. Thank you. Um, first of all, I mean, thank you, Brielle, for the presentation. As always, it's always you know very informative and, and well done. My question is, why are we receiving this proposal from a third party versus the city council being part of the designing of the Garvey Center? Um, this is a, another sensitive use, very similar to the Tiny Homes Village, that we should be involved with at every step. Is it because it's external funding 
that we're just kind of receiving a briefing on this. Uh, we, we also received something very similar with Project Home Key, uh, where that was a courtesy briefing, and we were very appreciative. But at the end of the day, these are very sensitive uses in our community. And the city council should be involved at every step. Otherwise, what am I here for? You know, I can just, I mean, if that's gonna be the case, I'm just here to rubber stamp, then I might as well just go home. So that's my question to start. I'm not sure if the mayor would like to answer first, but I can add that um, the city put forth an application to the Regional Housing Trust for use of this site. So um, it is definitely a project that was brought forth by the city. Um, we're here to be a partner, which includes the funding and technical assistance. So some of that technical assistance includes me standing here giving some um, updates, but this is very much a collaborative effort and I know um, if we were to move forward, there would be additional engagement with the city, um, come back to talk about design and more details. But um, as far as use that, that was brought forth before this council prior to today. And I agree with you, Brielle, that we did approve the funding source and the purchase, the acquisition of the site. But, you know, correct me if I'm wrong to my colleagues, but this is the first time that we see, you know, any rendering site plan uh, details of the project and it's being presented as if this is what's going to happen at the site. Um, usually what we do in this city is even if it's a private development, we like to be involved at every step of the project because of its impacts to the neighborhood. So even if it was a private development, I would be asking the same thing. Um, this, this should be no different. And, you know, what I would ask for is for us to really look at this as a full council. Let me remind everybody here that every member of this council has an equal weighted vote. There is not one person on this council that has greater influence than the other. So we should all be briefing, you know, we should all be part of the process at every step. And so I would ask that we, you know, hold off on any decision making until the full council is here to participate in the process um, versus kind of doing a rubber stamp. Yeah, so I just wanna add, so this is not the first time that we've seen renderings or any plans regarding this tiny home project. Uh, for the, I think for the last couple of uh, council communications from Enrique and from Public Works, we have seen renderings and we have been seeing sketches at least for like, at least for the last two or three months. So it's- Has it come to council mayor? Uh, well, you get those emails as well. So has it come to the council meeting? So I'm, has it come? Okay. Has it been agendized? I'm not. I'm not done talking. So I need you to not interrupt. It's not about it being agendized. We all have access to city council. We all have access to Sam. I don't have access just to Sam on every first and third Wednesday of the council meeting. It's up to the council to choose how involved they want to be. If a council member isn't here today, that's on them. You know, we can't slow down. We've slowed everything down. Just look at cannabis. Cannabis should have been fixed a year ago. But because people don't show up or because people aren't doing their due diligence on their free time, we're not getting things done as fast as we should. Uh, when we first opened up this project, we gave clear direction to Sam and to staff that we wanted a project that was family friendly, and they took that into consideration. <clears throat> Absolutely, Again, I agree with you. Yes, so at the end of the day, it is up to council members to get involved past the city council meetings and do their due diligence and speak to, to the team and get their input in as well. So I don't think anybody here is doing more than anybody or this is a one man project. I think it really is up to the council and I think I've said that before and that that's what it comes down to. It's up to the council to decide how involved they wanna be. You get a stipend, you wanna be involved 20 hours or 200, it really is up to you. So I don't think that uh, there's any sort of discrepancies here and you know we're, we're focused on the end result of this project. So to slow it down because of subjectivity or how it's gonna look uh, or based on the color of the inside of, of the floor, I mean, that's not really something that we're, that should be the priority when trying to get these people sheltered. Uh, Mayor, you know, with all due respect to the comments that you've just made, first of all, the process of the, the legislative process of the city of Baldwin Park is to bring items to the council for review, for consideration, approval, or disapproval. That's the legislative process here in the city as well as any other city. Now, if any one of us wants to spend all day at city hall you know, hand-holding and providing, that's, that, you're right, that is a discussion of, of every, every member, but that is not the legislative process. 
And I just want to remind everybody that that has been happening way too often. And here we have a third party with no offense to Brielle because you do a wonderful job. Third party giving the city a briefing on what's going to happen at a site that is extremely a sensitive use in our city. Every member of the council should, you know, have have been briefed about exactly the details of this project and we should be able to chime in on this and I agree that that was that today was a um, the opportunity to do that right and we have two members missing so I agree with you that today was an opportunity however this is look it looks like it's more baked than um, kind of preliminary or exploratory or even conceptual so that's my concern is with any project in the city, this council through the legislative process and legislative actions should be involved and provide input because we were elected by our, the members of this community to give the input, to be their voices. And if there's only one person that's kind of contributing to that, then um, we're all doing a disservice to this community because there are five elected members of the council. Again, that is a legislative process. So I agree that this was an opportunity for us to receive the briefing and information. Um, it, we received it as if it's pretty much a done deal. And I think that we really need to be involved at every step of the process, especially when there is a sensitive use like the one that's being proposed. Mayor, if I may. Yes, Council Member Damon. And I do wanna just mention that any council member that has been interested has been in the process. They've toured the process. They've talked to the uh, boss cubes. They've talked to Braille. They've talked to our staff. Like, nobody's taking over this project. We also did mention the sensitivities, and we did want security. We want all these things. This is how it is. If we had a update every two meetings, we wouldn't get anything done. But yes, go ahead, Councilmember Damon. Uh, thank you, uh, Brielle. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, when you were discussing the the renderings there of what the site may potentially look like. I did hear you say mention something about this is what it potentially may look like. So can you just clarify that for me, uh, Brielle? Is it something that has already been approved design-wise or is this just more of a rendering of what it can look like and still pend council approval? Sure. So the layout itself was to help figure out how, how um, the requisite number of beds could fit on, on the, the site. So I would also um, allow Sam from Public Works to, to add anything else there. But that's where this piece comes in. So a layout is needed to make sure that uh, the project can be produced within the funding that's available and within the space that's provided. So this is a way to make sure that all of the services are on site, make sure that that laundry and restroom trailer fits in there and that we can house all of the um, 50 family members that we mentioned. And then in terms of the next slide, which is the rendering, uh, this just helps bring it to life, right? We could talk about what it would look like to, to put up family tiny home units, um, but it's, it's a little bit hard to picture that without taking a look at what that looks like in 3D. So, I mean, these trees aren't purchased, the, the deck isn't purchased, so this is really, the paint isn't purchased. This really is just a rendering of what this could look like. Um, and I know that we learned at our last site how involved this city council is um, and, and how important color is to all of us and how we interpret sites. So this is definitely just um, our architect's recommendation and, and rec rendering, but none of this is um, finalized. Got it. Okay. So it was just more to give us a visual of what the site may potentially look like. Um, and still yet, we can make the modifications whether... We want a tree planted here. We want it there. We want this color instead of, you know, the orange, or uh, we want this deck instead of that deck. Uh, this is just basically for us to have a visual of the potential of what the site may look like. Correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. Council uh, member, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and uh, Damon. Yeah. I'd like to chime in real quick and provide some context. Um, so uh, at the uh, February 16th meeting, in that staff report, we did say that um, we asked city council for authorization to uh, you know, uh, move forward with the grant and to work on a schematic that would then be brought back to the city council for review. So we do have that in mind. Um, I do agree with everyone that today was a missed opportunity. Uh, we could have done that today. 
uh, but we didn't. But we, I just want to point out that what was shown is the architect's first stab at the at the project, which is this is this is what sets the the goal, the tone, the inspiration. Um, it's a grand um, design that you know we're trying to see if we can work with and meet with and then come back to the city council and provide the city council with an update and ask for direction. So that is um, coming up. Uh, I, I know that the, uh, the, um, the plan and the rendering that was um, submitted today or shown today, that was just a, a sneak peek at what we're working on. Thank, thank you, Sam. I'd also like to emphasize that the intent today was to get some consensus in order for us to uh, receive the funding from LASHA. That is probably the highest item on the priority and is definitely time sensitive because LASHA has approached us and indicated we do not need to apply for the fund. We just need to give a verbal and uh, they will allocate the money to us. If we should decide not to, then they will, re they will reallocate those monies to a pool of money that other cities can apply for. So we definitely have a proven track record and the intent today is more to get a consensus to uh, receive the money from LASHA, not only for Esperanza Villa, but for, but for the Garvey site. Thank you. Correct, and that, that was my next comment. So for tonight's purposes, it's not to, to agree on what the site's gonna look like. This is just basically an overview of the potential for the site. But the important thing here is for us to either agree to dis or disagree not to obtain the funding for the Esperanza, Esperanza Villa year two and for the Garvey site. Then once we decide whether we're gonna receive the funding or not, then we move on to the next step. And that would basically be the design process for the, uh, the Garvey site. And, I, and we could probably check with Sam one more time just for clarification. I believe we do have latitude in regards to the paint and some of the features, aesthetic features that will be placed there. When we applied for the funding, I wanna say last December, we had indicated it was going to be approximately 50 beds. So Sam and our architect kept that in mind when we planned for the uh, existing elements uh, associated with uh, the family site. Sam? That, that is 100% correct. Thank you, Manny. So, so the layout that you see is a, um, in line with uh, the uh, grant uh, requirements and in line with what we had presented to council back in February. And so um, the, the layout um, pretty much shows you know, how we can maximize the square footage to meet those requirements. And the rendering is just to show some, you know, just to show people what our inspiration is, is going to be, to, to have something to give people uh, an idea on how to visualize uh, what it might look like. And so uh, we can come back uh, with another study session and talk about directly all about the design and get direction from council at that time. Perfect, thank you. Mayor. Yes, Council Members. Thank you. And so, Sam, thank you for providing that clarification because it really um, helped me understand the purpose of the presentation. The way that it was being presented earlier is it was like a, almost a done deal. Um, so, Sam, thank you for providing that clarification. Um, I know that preliminarily and very conceptually, we did you know, approve the uh, fund or to seek out the funding and to acquire this property. Um, but I don't think we've ever really talked about, is it going to be for families? Is it going to be for seniors? Is it going to be for single occupants? Um, so, you know, that we've already jumped to a site plan without really discussing what is, who is this going to serve? And um, so this is the process that I'm referring to. And I, I mean, it, it looks nice and paint is always great, you know, aesthetics and all of that, it looks good. But the question is, have we really talked as a council about how this site is really going to serve? We had, there were different ideas that were thrown out about having a parking lot, you know, um, dedicated so that people can sleep in their cars. 
Um, now we're looking at, I think at like single occupants, if I understood that correctly. So again, it just earlier on, it looked, it did look like it was kind of a done deal, but I'd like to better understand, you know, who are we trying to serve here? Um, what is that going to look like? What is that little community going to look like? Is it going to be like the tiny homes um, where it's a single person per unit? Is it earlier on, I thought we were going to do families. Um, so is that fleshed out in this proposal or is there still opportunity to provide that input? And then if, obviously if, that's going to impact the design of the site. If I could interject, uh, Council Member, Garcia, in regards to the dynamics as associated with uh, the Garvey site, it is for families. So uh, yes. we are not going to house an individual there. That, how, that facility is specifically for families, and that's why there are several structures within that, those tiny homes that have larger rooms because we do not want to turn anyone away that may have five children or six children. Uh, so that's why there's partitions that could open up so the family unit can stay together. Okay, so at what point will we be able to actually look at the units themselves? I heard Cube Boss, or I think if I if I heard that correctly, but what are the units going to look like? I mean, if, if we're gonna have partitions and things like that, what does that look like? What does a structure look like? So. I'm, I'm thinking maybe we could have a uh, upcoming study session in regards to those units. I think we have enough information to share with the city council uh, so we could uh, generate some consensus, hopefully. But once again, the intent for tonight's presentation was just to receive direction to apply for those funds or to utilize those funds that Lasha's graciously offered to the city of Baldwin Park, not only at one site, but for two sites, which is almost unheard of. Thank you. And Manny, um, on the, the strings attached for the loss of funding is basically that both sites would require us to um, forego the background check, right? Correct. We, the, uh, the intent is to implement low barriers, housing first, policy. As Brielle mentioned, we are the only city in the area uh, per, uh, requesting background checks. So it is becoming increasingly difficult to work with a nonprofit uh, to coordinate those background checks. So if we do proceed with uh, the low barrier uh, no background checks. We will align ourselves with all the other agencies throughout Southern California. A prime example, we were at today's grand opening uh, of the Montebello facility, and they are implementing, or they have Im implemented uh, housing first, low barriers, so no background checks. And uh, so we would align ourselves with all the different uh, housing facilities. And, thank you. Thank you, Manny. And thank you for that. Um, here's my concern. You know, when we're talking about a family environment, where we're going to have children present, possibly single mothers, um, you know, a family environment, and then we don't have any background checks. That's a concern for me. And so that's where, again, you know, funding is always, of course, I am an advocate for going out and identifying funding, but you know, what are the strings attached and how does it make sense for what we're trying as a city and a city council, what we're trying to create at that site. So that would be my concern. I don't, I will not support funding that requires us to forego the background check. I'm okay with, you know, obviously credit issues, that's to be expected amongst our homeless population or people at risk of becoming homeless um, or being unsheltered. We already know they're gonna have credit problems, but if we're talking about criminal backgrounds and we are trying to create an, a family environment that includes children and single mothers and 
you know, very vulnerable population, then I would not be in favor. Yes, uh, Councilmember Garcia, just to add a little bit more information to, uh, to that comment, uh, there also is a sig significant process in terms of evaluation and a screening process. It is not a background check, but it definitely is a screening process where they ask a number of questions and you need to be a fit for the facility. So it isn't a background check, but there is another form of process to try to figure out if that individual or family is a good fit for the facility. And Manny, when is uh, this due? This is, when this is the is, deadline? Let me, I'm going to refer that to Eureka. She may have the specific data. I believe it's the 25th, but Eureka, it's on mute. That is correct. Um, the funding, would, the first round of funds for the LA County Esperanza, Esperanza year two are due May 25th, uh, which is the first ever uh, funding opportunity that cities and COGS receive. Uh, and as many had mentioned, this has been after months of advocacy, uh, an immense amount of support letters. Um, and just yesterday, the Board of Supervisors approved uh, additional funds coming to cities. So the first, um, the deadline would be May 25th. And there will be additional applications that could be submitted. But it is highly unlikely that uh, because of the funding structure that one district will get funded. Um, so we would like to be the first to submit the application for the project. Thank you, Eureka. As Eureka mentioned, the City of Baltimore Park would like to submit two projects, and that's in, in one district, and the City of Montebello will be submitting another project. So uh, there's five districts, and there's only $10 million to go around. So it is going to be very competitive, and we do definitely have the upper hand by, the, by Lasha asking for us to apply before the pool or the competitive element opens to the general public. Thank you. And one last question for Eureka or Manny. Um, if we do apply for this funding, are we pretty much committing to you know, their, their rules? Or is it that we could apply and then decide at that time whether it makes sense for our projects? I, I could go ahead and elaborate on, on that. There are strings attached or guidelines to their funding. So if by chance we do proceed with their funding, then we would need to abide by their guide guidelines. Mm -hmm. and, and to add to that, um, Councilwoman Garcia, there there has been a, a month of uh, advocacy to, with the county and LASA. And as you all um, recall, there's a Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. So this funding is actually reflective of that local preference. So this is very, it, it is the complete opposite of what happened with Motel 6. I think that with Motel 6, cities were not part of the conversation. Their opinions were not um, considered prior to these projects coming in. Mm -hmm. this, these funding sources do have latitude in terms of local preference, local nexus. So we would only be serving those in Baldwin, residents of Baldwin Park. In addition to that, we also advocated for communities that are, um, it, that are more vulnerable, such as undocumented individuals, which prior funding cycles did not allow. Um, and lastly, the um, additional local local approach. So there, there continues to be a considerate amount of local support uh, with these funds. And uh, LASA does recognize the lack of uh, kind of collaborative manner that initiated these these homeless efforts, but we have been in the forefront of continuing to advocate for that additional local um, interaction within the implementation of not only funds, but also the projects that are in our city boundaries. And so the screening process, like to understand um, 
you know, it would have been nice to have some of the information in advance, but the screening process, um, I think I, I, if I understood that process a little bit more, you know, and in depth, um, you know, I'm definitely open to hearing, but, or, you know, hearing what, what that process is. But again, you know, my concern is having that control over the site and, you know, without the background checks, most, most, most of concern would be the criminal background. Um, you know, again, that's an area that um, I have no, I don't have a comfort level for that at this point. You know, I was going to, I'm sorry, Mayor, uh, with regards to a hard decision that needs to be made, which will be in the next s section of the council meeting, the regular meeting, that would be for Esperanza. There, there's a timing consideration for sure. With regards to the Garvey site, and, and, and Esperanza has the same string, right? Even though that's already an up and running operation going forward, uh, we would have to abide by the no um, housing first policy. For Garvey, Manny and Eureka, must a hard decision be made? I mean, not in the open session, in the study session, obviously, but you're saying there, there would take an indication of whether we would be interested in applying for the actual grant for Garvey? That is correct. So the Garvey is not a grant-funded opportunity. It's a budget allocation um, directly through LASA, and it's part of their current fiscal year. So if the city was to approve that funding uh, source, we would have to let LASA know um, that we could move forward with that project or uh, seek to apply through the, through the traditional competitive process. I, I guess, Rico, I was saying, must that be indicated tonight or we I know we have to come back with a actual staff report with a decision but they would want to hear some sort of indication that is correct because they would have to um, open that allocation up for other cities that would be interested so if I could inter interject Mr. C CEO, uh, we could uh, maybe give uh, Lasha a, a soft yes as of right now, prepare a staff report for the first meeting in June in regards to the Garvey site. So we have a placeholder, and I would think that we'd be able to proceed that route for the Garvey site. And as mentioned earlier, uh, item number 10 on the consent calendar is on the agenda for the regular city council meeting. Uh, so we'll get some direction on that item this evening. So are we, we're giving direction now for the Garvey, for the 2.0 site, and then we're voting on Esperanza Villa at the 7 o'clock meeting. Yes, sir. Great. And so I just want to add um, that background checks aren't the norm in shelters. I personally work with domestic violence victims and their families, and we don't do that. We do um, intakes. We do a thorough intake, and depending on how they answer those questions, we can determine whether they are a good fit or not. Um, you know, a background check will not determine whether these people are a good fit for the, for the project, for the feeling of that community. So it's more of a intake, taking their information, uh, finding out if they what kind of assistance they need or what kind of issues they're dealing with, uh, depending on how they answer, depending on the age of the of the children that are with them. We do a, a more thorough intake, especially with teenagers, just because uh, you know they are a little bit more, um, you know, their, their their mood can be a little bit more volatile. We want to make sure that they too understand um, where they're going and why they're going and things like that. So, you know, I, I think it is very important that we um, we make sure because there is families that might have a, a record for something minimal right or something that isn't there anymore 10 years ago and so do we what do we do with these people right do we just let them be on the street with their kids because of something that happened five or ten years ago so me personally i know that it is a uh, big discussion i know that it sounds a little scary but uh you know just kind of working with with uh, families firsthand i know that that is not a uh, it is not this uh it, it's not representative of the shock value that that statement gives so, Mayor, just for clarification, so putting Esperanza Villa aside, because we're going to be taking that item up at the regular meeting. So do we have to give direction for the Garvey site now? We would love to receive some direction. If we do not receive direction, we will 
instruct Lasha that uh, we are very much interested, although we, uh, we need to prepare a staff report for the first meeting in June to officially receive the allocation. So Got it. What, what amount are we talking about for just the Garvey site, Manny? How much money would Lasha uh, allocate to us for the Garvey site? The total amount for Garvey um, has been uh, $840,000 uh, through a direct budget allocation. And we are trying to d d provide some direction to avoid those funds being part of the competitive pool process. Because all we have to do is say yes, and the, the funds are ours pretty much. Correct. Correct. So the way I look at it is like this. We have three options. We've already purchased the 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 site, right? We know that the reason why we did that to begin with was because Esperanza Villa did not house families. Um, so the biggest thing here is this site is gonna be geared towards families, single mothers, single fathers with children. Our three options are either we don't move forward with the project because we don't have funding for it and we purchase the site for nothing. We get the funds from LASA with the condition of no background checks, or we allocate the funding from our general fund. That's kind of the way I see it. Those are our three options. For me, I've, I've been dealing with a lot of <clears throat> homeless situations lately. Um, I know Manny, you're aware of that because I'm always calling you to figure out where we can place these people. The toughest part is when I get a call or an email or a text and it's either a single, uh, a single father or a single mother, and they've got a child with them or two or three, and they're living out of their car or they're literally out on the street. And there's nowhere for us to place them. And it gets to be very frustrating because the need is a lot bigger than our resources and our funding. So here we are with a, an opportunity whether, yes, I, I agree, I would, I would want to have more control and have those background checks. But uh, as many as you know, I believe since Esperanza Villa has opened up, we've had two participants that have been uh, pretty much kicked out of the, uh, of, the, of the facility for not following the rules. So apart from the intake and to make sure that they are a good fit, these are gonna be people with children, they're still gonna have to abide by the rules. And if they don't abide by the rules, then they get kicked out of the, of the program or the facility. I don't think we want to tap into our general fund for this when the funds are there. Um, for me, I would, you know, just based on the situations that we're facing right now, and I know that we're going to have a lot more families struggling in the future. And these are our Baldwin Park families that we're going to be serving. It's not going to be like Project Home Key where it's participants from all over the county. We have to, we have to accept the funds from LASA and this, at this point in time, we just have to be very careful to make sure that these participants are following the rules, um, you know, because we, we have to place them somewhere. We, we have to shelter these kids somewhere, these families somewhere. We have, we have nowhere to put them. So for, for me, I would, I would, uh, I would, I would be in support of obtaining the funds from, from LASA for this project. Yeah, and so, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I do want to add that if we don't house these uh, families with young children at uh, at um, the tiny home site, the new the new proposed site, you know, they're going to end up getting housed at hotels and motels and uh, places like the Grand Park Inn, where we know that it's not suitable for families. They don't have access to food. They don't have meals. They don't have the best uh, atmosphere or environment around them. So not only would we be giving them a, a much, much safer location, uh, we'd be giving them a place where they'll have a uh, room and space for them to uh, enjoy. Uh, I know that they're including a potential playground, uh, a uh, communal space so that they can do homework, have access to uh, resources. So, you know, I don't think, I think that all of those services outweigh that uh, background check. We also have to consider that we've been uh, showing frustration to the county, uh, not just as a city, but as a, as a, as a member of the region and the San Gabriel Valley because we haven't seen our fair return on, on Measure H dollars. So it sounds to me that this is not even a grant, this is a, a budget allocation, which means that it's more it's a more secure funding, making sure that we do have a a, uh, a, a, a more permanent or more structured funding, bringing our Measure H dollars back to our city, which I think we should be doing. Um, 
So I would say that, yes, we should be supporting this as well. And in the meantime, if uh, we'd like to learn more, I think our staff can find uh, family shelters and we can tour them and learn about that process as well and, and how they go about uh, their intakes. And I would just, just ask, Mayor, um, you know, because I remember when we first purchased the site, we went out there to see what the potential could be. Uh, we toured it. Uh, and we, we did have that where we wanted a, an area for children to be able to have kind of like a computer room, a homework room, so that they have the ability to be able to continue learning while uh, living there. Um, I would just ask that, you know, when it does come time for uh, the design process that we do include the entire council and just, you know, allow us all to have an input at, as to what we want the site to look like, um, just out of common courtesy for the entire council. Uh, but I think most importantly right now for me, um, you know, of course, I want the site to look great. I want them to live in a, in a great site, colorful. But for me, most importantly is just making sure they have a roof over their head you know, somewhere that we can actually send these families and these children to. To me, that is priority over, uh, you know, the aesthetics of the facility. Obviously, it's important. We want the facility to look nice. We want these participants to, to have pride of where they're living at, at least temporarily, right? But for me, the biggest priority is uh, giving these people shelter um, and taking them off the streets. So, Mayor, um, I mean, I, I think that Mayor Pro Tem's comments are very compelling, and I, I agree with you, Mayor Pro Tem, that, you know, this site is a perfect site for creating housing for, you know, people who are experiencing homelessness or that are unsheltered. Um, I know that there has been conversation about having families at the site. That is all very compelling. I am just getting this proposal for the first time um, since we had a very conceptual conversation with the acquisition of the site and moving forward in a very con conceptual um, you know, idea of what the site would, how it would serve our community. I'm not comfortable um, you know, with the screening process unless somebody here can tell me about what that process looks like and if we have like, you know, what is the, do we have full control of that? Can we actually create that uh, as a formality or can we formalize it, I guess? Can we, you know, really hold LASA or any other third party that's going to be part of this project? Can we hold them accountable to the screening process that we're comfortable with? I don't have any of that information. Does anybody, anybody here can speak to the screening process? Um, Anybody that has been, you know, working with LASA? Yes, Councilmember Garcia. We have uh, Brielle uh, Savello that will uh, elaborate a little bit more on the screening process. Thank you. Great, thank you. So this isn't um, particular to LASA's screening process. So LASA would actually just be providing the funds for the site, and there would be a competitive procurement for a service provider at the site. So the city would have the opportunity to work with the service providers selected or even earlier in the stage to make sure that what's put out in the RFP really includes what you're looking for in a service provider. Make sure that the, per the party you're hiring to operate the site and to do the checks um, really checks all the boxes for the things that are important to the city with the exception of actual background checks since that's not allowed by the funding source. Um, and then in the last two sites that we've done, it's been a really great collaborative process to work directly with that service provider at what does the intake look for this particular site, especially because every city is so different. And here, when we're talking about a different um, service population to really consider the needs of families in the city of Baldwin Park. So to help um, build staff's understanding, um, this, the city and myself, we met with Union Station Homeless Services, who's the family service provider lead here, and we asked how the process works for their families. Um, it was really helpful to learn that they've typically seen families of a size of three to four. It, it's varying um, compositions in terms of head of household and number of children, um, and they also talked about 
their intake process with families and how they work to make sure that each client's needs is being met. So we do have some partners we can look to for how it's done at their sites. But I think that the really big and exciting piece is to be able to work directly with the service provider that would work at the Garvey site to create something that really fits this site and the families that are unhoused here. So Brielle, I'm, what I'm hearing is we will have the opportunity to work with the chosen operator of the site to develop our screening process. Yeah, so it, it's actually part of something a little bit larger called the operations plan. So the, the city will have the opportunity to um, say what, what the site is going to look like. So they'll have the opportunity to talk about what does that intake process look like? Um, what kind of services are provided to clients? You know, in our, in our other contracts, we've put things like transportation to make sure that clients can get to appointments and jobs and really creating just a comprehensive site plan that helps meet clients' needs and the um, intake and, and um, evaluation process is definitely part of that. It's informed by the service provider's best practices, but also um, hands-on development with staff. Okay, so give me an example. Thank you for that information. Give me an example of uh, where, like where somebody would be excluded from being part of the community. Yeah, so something that would exclude a client from our current Esperanza Via site is um, an inability to take care of something called their activities of daily living. So to live at that site, you have to be able to feed yourself, to bathe yourself, to not have a, a health need where you would need to be in a... Um, in care in a facility, so that's um, one of the metrics. And then you also have um, rules that each client has to abide by. So sites have um, no visitors allowed, they have rules for times of entry and exit, um, use of your bed, right? So a client could lose their bed for, for, for non-use of the bed, um, and these are all things that, that um, are part of this plan. And then also just um, behavioral, um, rules so to make sure that there's no violence at the site so there is a way to to shape this so that it is safe for everyone on site and really informed by um, what service providers are experiencing at other sites in their vast experience okay would we be able to assess whether somebody was a sex offender and exclude them from the community so the only way to do that would be to run a check and that is excluded from this process. We did specifically ask this question of Union Station, thank you for reminding me, um, to find out how they deal with this, especially because you have um, youth and, and understanding what this process looks like. And this is also included in their services plan. So it is really the responsibility of each parent or guardian to have, um, to watch their child or their children. So each Family has their own unit um, and control of who enters that unit. And then in communal spaces, there, there should never be uh, a child left unattended. So there are rules in place to make sure that um, children are taken care of, that there is no opportunity for anything untoward to happen at the site. That operations plan would also include information about use of communal spaces, like the laundry room or the bathroom or anywhere where you might be worried about visibility. So it's a really comprehensive document and it outlines not only what the clients are abiding by, but what um, staff is doing. So what are those 24 seven staff um, doing to ensure? So their, their um, wellness checks of clients, their monitoring of those shared spaces. And it's really just a, a mutual agreement between anyone staying at the site and the operator of the site to make sure that everyone is, is safe and taken care of. And of course, you know, I am thinking about the constituents that will be living on site as well as off site. And um, my, my next question is, okay, with, with the existing tiny homes village, do they have a background check or is it also, do we forego that process? There is a background check process happening currently. Um, to extend the use of the site and to accept the funds that we're talking about in the next session, uh, that process would um, we'll no eliminated. longer continue. As okay. of November. Okay. And then um, my next question is, I heard you mention referrals, that there were three referrals from, I can't remember what organization, you had a slide on it. Um, are these all referrals from people living in the city currently? 
Okay. Yes, just for clarification, so, anyone staying at the tiny homes as Speranza Villa needs to have a nexus that, that uh, they are living in the city of Baldwin Park. They're living mm -hmm. on the street, in their car, and so on. They, they need to be somehow connected to the city of Baldwin Park. And Manny, what would be the alternative funding? I know that El Mani was successful in identifying their own funding and you know, having their own home key project. I'm not sure how they did that or if they partnered um, with a nonprofit. I don't know the mechanics of that, but they have full control from what I understand. Yes, yes. There's, there's, there's funding available to purchase a hotel and create uh, our own version. And Eureka could, uh, this might be a great op opportunity to discuss this and Eureka could elaborate a little bit more on that. That is correct, um, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman uh, Garcia. The city of Omani's model is uh, behind the uh, project home key element, um, which also has that ability, that local control ability, uh, but it is a housing first model and it actually is um, an extension to serve the region rather than just their local, um, a local nexus. So those, those funds are, um, they are uh, operated through the city. However, there's still those elements of housing first low barrier with the city yeah. of El Monte. Okay, okay, so they do, they go with the low barrier as well. Yeah, okay. basically every, every existing homeless service provider, um, we were the exception in year one of Esperanza Villa, primarily because it was an, it was, the funding was through an innovative strategies fund that came down from the county with no, with no um, restrictions at that time. However, best practice does point to um, uh, the national evidence-based models with Housing First. And every successful um, city, along with uh, continuums of care like Pasadena, uh, Montebello, Pomona, everyone who has uh, implemented homeless services for quite some time, all, up, all un operate under a Housing First model. Okay. Well, again, if I, if I think about what we're trying to create at the Garvey site and having families there with children, and then, you know, of course the surrounding, that's, that site I feel is a lot more accommodating than let's say the Esperanza site, but, you know, for a, a project like this, especially if there's low barrier um, without background checks, but, you know, when I think about what we're trying to create there with families and allowing folks that may have a history of sexual abuse and, you know, criminal background as a sexual predator, I have to question, you know, what we're creating at that site and what we're encouraging in that neighborhood. Um, and I know that we want to keep sight of and focus on families that we're trying to serve, but in that same vein, you know, we, we want to create a healthy, positive environment, safe environment. And I just wish that we had a funding source that gave us more control to do those background checks. I know that would definitely put me um, in a more comfortable position. I mean, it's, this information is, is, I've, I first received it what, a few days ago um, and I'm still not at a comfort level with it. And even for the, all the compelling reasons that have been stated here um, very eloquently by Mayor Pro Tem um, and you know, all of you, I'm just not at a comfort level for, for it. And I wish that we really had the local funding. Um, are there any opportunities that that could become a possibility no, we have explored all options, um, and because LA County is a uh, first, you know, following that model, any of our hopes for future funding, even at the local level, um, which we do uh, anticipate an, an additional budget 
uh, increase of funding local returns to increase it in the next five years, we do not see the housing first going away from those uh, funding mechanisms. And um, I think that the more and more we've researched and looked into housing first, um, we have began to understand the uh, legal implications behind um, operating outside of that norm um, when it comes to uh, housing rights and uh, a lot of the other um, advocacy groups that support housing first models. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, Eureka. I'm still not at a comfort level with it. So I'm just going to let's continue with the conversation. Great. And then, uh, Thank Mayor, you. Mayor Pro Tem, are you, what is your position? No, I mean, at, at this point in time, we, you know, like I mentioned before, we only have three options. There's no, uh, there's no other funding source that we can look out for. Uh, we've already purchased the site. Uh, we need to shelter the family. Uh, for me, unfortunately, there's, you know, there's, like I said, there's no other, no other funding source. So uh, I mean, you know, let's, let's, let's get the money and move forward. We need to we need to place these families somewhere. Great. So I think at this point, um, we are at a two to one. And I think that's um, because there's only three of us here that that does, that is enough to uh, give direction. Is that correct? The uh, city attorney? Yes, Mr. Mayor, you can still give direction um, if there's a um, bill to do so and a majority. Great. Okay. So it sounds like uh, council member is in favor. I am as well. I would uh, ask that we just, uh, next time we talk about this, we just bring more information uh, that backs up, that backs the housing first model uh, to, uh, you know, uh, be able to defend our, our stance on this and why it's so critical that we move forward. So thank you, Seth. Thank you. So at this moment, I believe that is the end of our open uh, study session. Thank you, uh, Brielle, Eureka, Manny, for your due diligence. Um, at this Mayor? Moment, we will, yes, Council Member. Can we take a vote on that for public record? Sure. Can we take a, can we do a motion? Yeah, that, um, it's not an agendized item. It is a, um, a direction so we um, I don't think that you can I don't think you're prohibited from taking a vote but I don't think you have to take a vote is so if it's just to provide direction I mean isn't this the final isn't this a, an actual it's not an action a council action no it's just direction so we'll vote on the actual funding for tiny homes at seven o'clock and then once the Garvey site comes back we'll vote on that as well so there'll be a record okay great so at this moment we will uh, we will move to recess to close session